Welcome to our second service. So let's sing just over in a glory, in the glory land. Let's sing that. Of a home prepared where the saints abide, just over in the glory land. How I long to be by my Savior's side, just over in the glory land. On our town, just
for everybody else to spread out. If you don't want to be too close to the guy next to you who maybe forgot to wear deodorant today or... Yeah. Uh, so... They can't smell online. <laughs> uh, ladies, if you went to the ladies' retreat, I received... Uh, some Somebody paid for this. A USB with... Uh, the sessions. Uh, so I have like four of these little USB, you know, you put in your computer and listen to the sessions. So someone paid for it. I don't, they didn't send, tell me who. It was 20 bucks someone paid online. So if no one did it, I have, like, we just have some extra stuff. But if you did it, it's in my office after and I can give it to you. All right? All right, so everybody, uh, the, all, all the youngins are downstairs now. So Dale Sinico, right? As I said, last name right? telling you, sometimes names can get me really messed up. Uh, none of your friends are here, it's just us. You, you don't have very nice friends at Bible College. They all went downstairs. They don't know that we're really the cool crowd, right? That's right. I got a hearty amen for that. Yeah, that's right. We're the ones with disposable income. Or hardly any, but some. <laughs> But anyway, we're so glad. Uh, great job this morning, right? Faith Amen. we did singing. Great blessing. Arlo did a great job. Open the word. And yes, I will always give Arlo a hard time. Amen. But you know what's so cool? I was thinking about it after. And Marco too. I didn't give Marco. Marco goes really red when I give him a hard time. So <laughs> keep that down low. But uh, you know what's really neat is that Marco, Arlo, other interns we've had, you know, they come to train and, you know, I love and enjoy doing that. But you know, we, we impact them. So wherever they go, there's a little bit of us tagged along, which is kind of cool. You know, it helps them grow. It helps us understand more people and things. So we get to play a part, uh, faith by training them stuff, but this is the practical side. We love doing that. So we're so excited for it. But Dale, I won't take any more of your time. Come on up here, sir, and open the word for us. We're glad you're here. All right. I'd like to thank you all, church family, once again, for allowing us to come to be a blessing to you all through song and through fellowship. And uh, thank you as well for an even greater privilege to bring you God's message this afternoon. So why don't you just take your Bibles now with me to the book of James. We'll be in James chapter 3 today. James chapter 3. While you're turning there, in the previous chapter, in James chapter 2, James in, uh, focuses on this topic of faith versus works. Faith and works, how each are both directly related one to another. And for our faith to become living faith, I mean, our, we do serve the living God, Amen. so our faith ought to be a living faith. That's right. For it to be a living faith, it needs to be evidenced by our works. We need to live out our faith in our lives. And the Bible says in James two seventeen to 18, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So we ought to be showing um, the evidence of our living faith through our works. <coughs> and it simply does not make sense to have one without the other. James ends off the chapter in, uh, in verse 26 by illustrating this truth. He says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. 
And this now leads us to the chapter we'll be focusing on in James chapter 3. <coughs> and as we look at it, we'll see how our living faith ought to be expressed, and, and not just in what we do, but specifically in what we say, in our speech. Now, isn't it interesting how easily we let our tongue go? We allow it to speak nonsense, we, 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 we create criticisms, we boast, and a lot of times, I myself am guilty of this. And uh, my girlfriend and I, we have this uh, ongoing joke the past few years. Uh, she, she actually, in this, my freshman year of college, she told me like a random fact. I don't even know if it's true. She said uh, that people who can't control their, their tongues have an underdeveloped frontal lobe. And if you know what a frontal lobe is, it's the front part of your brain that controls your speech. So now, whenever she notices in my face that I'm about to say something really mean, or if I'm about to say something really dumb, <laughs> she'll like tap my tap my head, you know, stare at me like, like yes, ma'am. <laughs> and but the truth of the matter is, you know, so many times we speak without thinking, we mm. speak without any control, and and later on we end up regretting what comes out of our mouths. And I want to ask you guys today, who are you allowing to control your speech? Are you allowing yourself, your, your flesh, or are you allowing the spirit that is living inside of you? And so let's read now in our text, in, in, in James chapter 3, in verse number 1, the Bible says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, in this, the same is a perfect man, and able to br also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths, and that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven off fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things, Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father. And therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, even the fine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. And so with the time that we have, we will be recognizing that speech under control is truly the revelation of the Spirit's control of our lives. And the title of the message today is, Who is in Control? Who is in Control? And so we'll be looking at three different aspects of controlling the tongue. And the first that we'll notice is the command to control the tongue. The command to control the tongue. And as part of this admonition to control the tongue, we ought to accept our, our need for accountability regarding everything that we say. And to obey this command that we've been given, we must first accept the need for accountability. In the first verse, in verse 1, the Bible says, My brethren, James says, Be not many masters. And the word masters here is the Greek word didaskalos which can also mean uh, teacher, it can also mean instructor. And when James here says, be not many masters, he's not necessarily discouraging us to not teach one another God's word. He's not necessarily telling us to not become teachers, but instead he's encouraging us that if we want to be a teacher, which we should all have the desire to relay God's, uh, God's word to someone else, or if we are already a teacher, he's encouraging us to not take this role lightly. But can I also say this? As a teacher, we ought to not have also to put on this persona that uh, we're so high and mighty, that we know everything, uh, and thinking that everyone should be judged by our own standard. 
But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that we are all judged according to God's measure of light. Mm -hmm. Knowledge does not give us the right to look for a fault in others. It doesn't give us the right to express arrogance in our correction of others as well. Jesus says in Matthew 7, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So God has given each of us different abilities. He's, giving us, he's given to us various gifts and talents. And what we do with those talents and abilities are judged according to His measure of light. So as teachers, we ought to speak instead with a sense of humility and also have this spirit of, of, and a desire to learn. But you may be asking yourself, why should we take this role or authority of a teacher lightly well look, let's look at the rest of the verse in verse 1 it says um, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation so James is saying that those who have the position of a teacher whether it be a, a preacher uh, whether it be a Sunday school teacher whether it be a, like a, 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 a someone um, discipling a, a new convert or just teaching your kids Bible lessons he says that we will receive a stricter judgment because their accountability is greater. And it's very easy for us to take this position as a teacher uh, uh, without recognizing the gravity that it holds, the importance that it holds. And so as we teach, may we recognize that, may we recognize what is at stake. May we recognize um, uh, to, that we must prepare ourselves to teach with purpose, with great thought, recognizing the need for right doctrine, but also, on the other hand, we must recognize the dangers of producing any disorder and confusion. Because the Bible says we will be judged by everything that we say. In Matthew 12, 36-37, Jesus, Jesus says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. During James' day, it may be that uh, being a teacher was popular. You know, Paul goes through in, in his epistles how there's been so many false teachers. A lot of new doctrines have been uh, popping up and arising. And so maybe being a teacher was popular during James', James, uh, James time. And, but James is here is saying that there will be degrees of judgment on judgment day. He says we, including himself as a teacher, will receive the greater judgment or, or, or greater condemnation. And one commentator says this about the, uh, this greater condemnation. The comparative adjective greater implies degrees of treatment at the judgment seat. So although we are all judged according to God's holiness, each person will be judged um, relative to the privileges that God has given them. He says, uh, Jesus says in Luke 12, 48, For unto whomsoever much is given... Of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. So this this same principle applies to to teachers as well. We have been given much. We've been given uh, the responsibility to teach others God's word. So we are accountable for everything that we teach. We are accountable for everything that we say. <coughs> but notice how he begins verse number two, and I like how he begins it too. He says, "For in many things we." offend all. Mm -hmm. Another reason why we are to be accountable for our words is because of our own weaknesses. <laughs> now the word offend here could also mean to cause to stumble, stagger, fall, to make a false step, basically to make a mistake. And at the end of the day, we are all human. We will all mess up. We all have our own daily struggles. And James himself includes himself in this verse. He, and, and so I want to encourage you to not be discouraged, but also challenge you to not create excuses for the offenses that you make or, or for the failures that you, that, you, that you have. And by recognizing our weaknesses, we should be striving to develop a better relationship with God, to further our walk with God, following the Spirit's leading in our lives and pressing on to be the child of God that He wants us to be. But notice especially the area that we're all susceptible with, our daily struggle. In, in verse 2, James continues on by saying, If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also 
to bridle the whole body. Now, I'm a Filipino. I'm pretty sure you guys already figured that out. <laughs> I, love you. I know a lot of you here are Filipinos as well. So don't uh, throw rocks at me for this uh, illustration that I'm going to use. <laughs> but uh, there's this word in, in, in Tagalog, and it's the word chismis. And if you know what that means, uh, for all you uh, non-Filipino folks, it's, it means the word gossip. And uh, back home in the Philippines, I live in a very small uh, neighborhood. Almost uh, everyone in my neighborhood is one of my relatives, probably. Um, that's because my grandma has also seven siblings. So I have so many relatives that I can't even keep up with. And so a lot of times w when we lived there, everyone would know everything about everyone. And I was always so confused at that. Like I, Something would happen to me at school and my, my grandma would come home angry at me. And I'm like, how did you even know that already? <laughs> I just got home. <laughs> and the, but the truth is, like, everyone knows everything about everyone, not because you said it, but someone has said it to them. But isn't it true that our daily struggle can also be our tongue in our speech? And oftentimes, we, we speak without any self-control, without any thoughts. We say things we shouldn't say. We type out things in social media we'll later on regret. Mm -hmm. And it's, it really is just simply a part of our daily struggle in our lives. And, and it's an essential part of our character that we must work on. Mm -hmm. and to strive to become, quote unquote, of the perfect man. Mm -hmm. and, and now obviously we ourselves cannot be perfect. Um, but the word used here for perfect, it suggests the idea of uh, spiritual maturity. James is saying that one way we can measure the spiritual maturity of teachers, just according to the context here, but also it can be applied for all Christians, is whether or not we have temperance or discernment or, or any control in the words that we say. Jesus teaches us in Matthew 12 that our words reveal who we truly are, our inner character. He says, he says for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good, measure, good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of the uh, bringeth forth evil things. Our words are an important measure of our relationship with God. By listening to what you say outside of these walls, uh, how, what you say to your family, what you say to your, your friends, your coworkers, or even strangers, really shows us where you, are, where you are in your walk with God. And the same with those for me as well. But if we have the spiritual maturity to control our tongue, we have the ability to control our whole body. That's what, the, that's what this uh, chapter says. That it's, it, that's just simply how powerful our tongue is and how difficult it is to tame. So we recognize the, the, that we must accept our need for accountability and to, we must obey this command to control the tongue. But we must also acknowledge the tongue's ability. Acknowledging the tongue's ability. Look in verse 3 with me. The Bible says in verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mounts, that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. And these two, these two verses illustrate to us the power of the tongue, the control of the tongue. By putting a small bit in a horse's mouth, it, it creates uh, pressure in and around uh, the mouth of the horse. And this pressure is used to control the horse's speed, uh, the direction the horse is going. And on the other hand, the other illustri illustration that we saw, a large ship, think of like the Titanic, a large ship that is being moved by strong winds, it can be maneuvered easily by this very small helm. The little rudder at the back of the ship, that little flap controls where the direction the ship is going. And you know what these, these illustrations teach us? It teaches us that we must not undermine the power of the tongue. Mm. And if we are careless in this area, if we are allowing our flesh to speak out all our boastings, all our bitterness, all the criticisms, all the anger that we have in our hearts, they will all be expressed. However, if we are yielded to the Holy Spirit's control and, and, and guidance in our lives, godliness will be expressed out of our hearts. Remember what it said in verse number two, whoever can control the tongue 
can bridle the whole body. And even though, even though the, that bit is very small compared to the size of the horse, even though that small helm is very tiny compared to a large ship, even though our tongue is so tiny compared to our whole body, it has the power to steer our lives towards evil or towards good. And, and friend, can I ask you today, who has the reins of your mouth? And ultimately, who has the reins of your life? And may we seek constant reliance on the Spirit on this matter. And let's look at verse number 5 where the Bible says also, it can, James continues on by saying, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great, great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire um, of hell. So in the two previous illustrations, we saw how the tongue's ability to control the body, how it, it has the ability to uh, steer our direction, our direction in life. But this illustration now teaches us um, the destructive power that the tongue possesses. Now we've all heard the news, especially this past week, of the different wildfires going on out west, out east, and now he, even, even here in Ontario, how the wildfires have destroyed nature, destroyed homes, and even maybe communities. And these great fires, they spread all throughout the land, large hectares of land. And, and, and you know what? They all began from one single spark. Mm. And this just shows us how, how our tiny tongue can pollute our whole body, our whole character. Mm. And even though after so many days, the, the firefighters have been working so hard to put out those fires, once those fires have been put out, what is left? The great damage has already been done. And this is truly the destructive nature of an uncontrolled tongue. This is what James is trying to portray to us in this verse. One commentator says this about an uncontrolled tongue. It is as though all the wickedness in the whole world were wrapped up in that little piece of flesh. You know, we notice how it can, uh, the tongue can be used in such a destructive way and in such an evil way. But what does the Bible says? The Bible says that we, it can be used in a very good way as well. In, in Proverbs 12, 25, um, the Bible says that heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. In Proverbs 16, 24, it says pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Proverbs 18, 21 says death and life are in the power of the tongue. <laughs> And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So even though the tongue can be used uh, for destructive reasons, it can also be used uh, to bear forth godly things, to encourage one another, to uplift one another, to bear one another's burdens. And, and that's, it can only be used in that way if we are able to control our tongue. And if we are to control the power of our tongue, we must also recognize the complexity of controlling the tongue. In verse number 7, the Bible continues on by saying, For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed, and has been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. James here gives us another picture, but this time it's referring to the difficulty of taming the tongue. And he says that even taming a wild animal is easier than taming the tongue. And honestly, when I thought about that, I, 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 thought, I realized how crazy that truth was. You know, I've been, on a, I've been last year on a missions trip to Africa. And if you go to Africa, you'll inevitably, inevitably just see wildlife all around you. While I was there, I saw different animals like monkeys, monitor, monitor lizards, snakes, flamingos, peacocks, warthogs, everything. And... And to think that people can tame all those wild animals, those unpredictable and seemingly uncontrollable animals, but we can't even control something that's so tiny, something so insignificant, something that we have, like our tongue, it, it really baffled me. But it truly goes to show how difficult 
it is to control our tongue. The Bible says the tongue can no man tame. But you know who can control it? God can. The Holy Spirit that's living in, within you. And without the power and without the control of the Spirit, we will always fail in this area of our life. We will always fail in our speech. God Himself is the only one that is mightier than our tongue. Think of the life of, of Jesus on earth. Though he was fully God, he was also fully man. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 how he was in all points tempted, um, as, like as we are, yet without sin. In every word that Jesus spoke, never did he speak of anything unwise, never did he speak of anything unworthy, unholy. Instead, he always pleased and glorified the Father in heaven and, and everything that he said. And aren't you glad that this same Jesus is the same Jesus that lives inside of you today. Amen. Amen. But let's notice as well the contradicting character of the tongue. It says in verse 9, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. The same tongue that we use to bless God, mm. to praise God, is the same tongue that we can use to curse others as well. And in other words, our tongue can be used for the highest calling, but it can also be used for the lowest evil. And when we, can, when we consider the numerous times we have all failed in this matter, it truly is a shame to think that we've grieved God so many times in this way. And as a child of the holy God, this shouldn't describe us. James says, my brethren, this things ought not so to be. And, and James in, in James chapter number one, in the very first chapter, James says in verse 26, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. So if we're seemingly in tune with God, if we're playing the part, if, if we're seemingly faithful to the Lord, if we're seemingly discerning the voice of the, of the Spirit, but we don't have the control of our tongue, the Bible tells us that we are only deceiving ourselves. We are lying to ourselves. And that we don't actually believe in what we say we believe in. But to combat this contradicting character, we must live the opposite life. We must live a consistent life to say, to be, to say um, what we believe. And what we say at church should be the same as what we say at our homes, should be the same as what we say at our workplace. And because a consistent character is, is really produced out of a transformed life. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Jesus Christ has paid the price for our sins. So we have the responsibility now to live a consistent character, to live according to his example that he has presented us. And may we exercise Ephesians 4, 29 in our lives. Where the Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is, which is good, don't us here, to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We must use our tongue to, to edify one another, to exhort one another, to, to encourage one another. So we looked together at how we are to control our tongue, and how we are to use our tongue, and how whoever controls our tongue can ultimately guide us in the direction of our lives. Well now, we will, we will look at the conduct of a controlled tongue. The conduct of a controlled tongue. In verse 13, the Bible says, Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. A wise man does not only have knowledge, but he also has wisdom. Because knowledge it's just simply knowing knowing and understanding. While on the other hand, wisdom 
is doing what we know and understand. Wisdom can be defined as who we are versus what we do. So to be truly a wise man, we must have both knowledge and wisdom. But notice, notice with me where true wisdom is re revealed. True wisdom can be seen through a good conversation. Yeah. Our, our character, our behaviors, our attitudes, our words, all of these things in our, uh, as part of our lives ought to encourage and uplift. This is, this is the purpose um, that, that our character should be. True wisdom can also be seen also in our works. We have all heard the, the phrase, um, if you're going to talk a talk, you've got to walk the walk. Mm -hmm. Or in other words, uh, practice what you preach. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, our works ought to be a reflection of our words, should it not? That's right. And James here is exhorting us to display good character through the works that we do. But notice how we are to, how we are to do those works. He says, with meekness of wisdom. True wisdom is relative to a meek manner. And when you think of wisdom, you don't necessarily think of of someone who is out of control. You don't think of someone who's angry, no. You think usually of someone who is temperate, who is mild, who is submissive. In Titus 3.2, the Bible says, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. This should be our attitude to, towards one another. This should be the character that we must be putting on. But notice as well how the Bible describes true wisdom. Let's skip down to verse 17. Notice how the Bible describes true heavenly wisdom. The, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. This is what it truly means to have heavenly wisdom. Wisdom that is from above. The Bible says that it is pure. It's absent of any sinful attitudes. Then the Bible says that it is peaceable. It seeks to, le to live in peace with others. Gentle. Someone who is courteous. Someone who is honorable. Easy to be entreated. It's, it's a willingness to submit and sacrifice for what is right. Full of mercy. Merciful. Compassionate. And good fruits. is to be expressed in our good, in our good works. True wisdom is without partiality. It's impartial in our treatment of others. And the last one is, and without hypocrisy. True wisdom, true heavenly wisdom is honest. It's sincere. It's genuine. It's authentic. And these are the marks of a Christian with true heavenly wisdom. And can I say something? If, if, if I compare myself to this standard, to these eight qualities, I find that I myself don't measure up. Mm -hmm. And how about you today? Mm -hmm. which, which of those um, eight qualities do, are you lacking in? And do you find yourself lacking in some of those things? Well, to be honest, that's just the reality of it. We do lack. Mm -hmm. in, James, in James chapter 1 verse 5, what does James say? He says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally. And upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. To receive wisdom, we need to simply ask of God. Mm. He will give us the wisdom that we, the, uh, the, all the wisdom that we need. But where do we find that wisdom? We can find that wisdom through His Word. Amen. He will give us all the wisdom that we need through His Word. One commentator even says this: When we want wisdom, the the place to begin and end is the Bible. Amen. True wisdom will always be consistent with the Word of God. And so we saw how speech under control is truly the revelation of the Spirit's control of our lives. We saw how God has commanded us to control our tongue. How our living faith ought to be expressed in not just what we do, but in our, our temperance, in our discernment of everything that we say. On the other hand, we also saw the complexity of controlling the tongue. How our tongue is so powerful that we ourselves cannot even tame it. But, but we, we recognize who can tame it. We recognize that God is the only one who can control the power of our tongue. How it can be used for good and for godly things. And 
And we need to be, we need to be spirit-led, being submissive to His guidance and strength to control our tongue. And finally, we saw the conduct of a controlled tongue. How the tongue that is controlled by the Spirit can bear forth the fruits of wisdom, heavenly wisdom. And so I want to ask you once again today, who is in control of your tongue? Who has the reins of your mouth? And ultimately, who are you allowing to guide your life? If your answer is, well, honestly, you know, I, no one is, I don't know. That is a dangerous place to yeah, be. Right. Because remember, the destructive nature of an unattended tongue, an uncontrolled tongue. You might even say, I am, I have, I have, I think I have self-control. I'm in control of my tongue. Well, we know that our speech is a revelation of our heart. And the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Yeah. Who can know it? That's right. But can you honestly say today that it is God, it's the Holy Spirit in me that is guiding me in all that I say and in all that I do? And can I challenge you today that when the Spirit speaks to you, when He says, he might tell you, don't say what you're about to say. He might even tell you, go encourage that, that brother who is struggling. Or go talk to that person with the gospel. And can I encourage you to obey the Spirit's leading in your life? And you know what? If you're obedient to the Spirit, you will not regret it. Mm. But we can only hear the Spirit if we are in His Word daily. If we're daily walking with God. If we're always seeking Him. Seeking His face every day. Mm. One pastor said this, Early wis Earthly wisdom is doing what comes naturally. Godly wisdom is doing what the Holy Spirit compels us to do. And may we be obedient to what He compels us to do. And I want to ask you once again, who is in control of your time? Who is in control of your life? Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you Lord for your word. Thank you Lord for the message that we receive from your word, Lord, the, the exhortation to control our tongue. And Lord, we, we know our struggles, we know our weaknesses, and may you just give us your strength. May you uh, give us wisdom on how to control our tongue. And help us, Lord, to always obey you, always be submit, submitted um, to your will for our lives. Help us to, um, uh, to live out what we say that we believe. And help us to... Uh, help us to follow your example that you have set for us as well. And I pray that you'd uh, um, continue to give us uh, your, your wisdom and grace and, and thank you, Lord, for your mercy toward us. And thank you, Lord, for this day that we, uh, we spend at your house and pray that you would uh, be glorified and honored in, in all that we do and all that we say, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. What a great message about the tongue Amen. that uh, so often gets away on us, right? We get ourselves in some big trouble, and I appreciate that. Uh, uh, you know what? Something I will never forget now. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> think, think, but what's going on here? But at any rate, uh, it's good to have those little things to help us. What, how, what am I saying? And how am I saying it? Does it need to be said? There's lots of things we can say, and there's absolutely not needed to be said, you know, uh, just watch it. So I appreciate that so much, and uh, you're graduated college, what's going on? <laughs> not, I'm not telling you to come here, I'm just asking a question, because uh, it's always encouraging to hear, as someone's yeah. gone through Bible college, what's the next steps are. Uh, right now, I'm still uh, praying about a couple, a couple of churches I'm looking to work at, hopefully... Uh, I'm planning to work at a church this fall. How about okay. a church by then? Good. Uh, for now, just going on tour. Right, so. tour. That's grand. We need so many more young men, middle-aged men, older men to get up and, and preach the word uh, like was just then, uh, done for us. And uh, the need's right across the land. So I appreciate your willingness to do that. So, all right, well, I'll pray and we'll be dismissed. And uh, I do appreciate you being in church today. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for another day. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage our hearts. Uh, we've been challenged uh, today by the messages, by the singing. And I hope indeed our fellowship, what we have said, has been a challenge and encouragement to one another. Oh, Lord, help us to guard the tongue and, and to help us to be looking to you for wisdom. We need your wisdom to use our tongue correctly. Lord, I pray you bless us now, encourage us. 
uh, with the day's events. And Lord, I know a wedding uh, shower coming up just shortly here at our church. I pray that all go well as well. And Lord, you are so good to us. Help us to have a grateful uh, spirit, giving you all the honor and glory now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Amen. It was. It is. <laughs> no. Hey. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it.